we've allowed the cancer of relativism to infect us, so we think there are no shared universal values, and there is no freedom without those shared universals. Vrijheid is iets wat je niet kan waarderen wanneer je het helemaal hebt. Je moet het een tijdje niet hebben en dan pas begrijp je wat je mist. Reverse the question. Can art destroy the world? And I think it can. You can choose either to be abused or not. The political news is robust. The safety of journalists. We hacked into the audience and then all of a sudden 300 phones would ring, you know. Yeah, good evening, everybody. Um, warm welcome. Welcome to everybody. Welcome in the Bali. Um, my name is Tim Wagemakers, and I'm program editor at the Bali, and I'll be your host tonight at this night with Evgeny Morozov. Um, before the grand introduction, who's read a book by Evgeny Morozov? Who's read the articles this weekend? <laughs> okay, that says something about maybe how much we read these days. Um, are there people in the room who felt that they were the ones Evgeny was talking about in not so flattering way? <laughs> Are there people who work in data? Yeah? I'm not saying those should be the same ones as <laughs> the question before, okay? So just for that. Are there people who say they are here because they want um, more analysis about Amsterdam and what's going on right now with Airbnb, Uber, Booking? Okay, we have some people here. Are there people from outside the Netherlands? Yeah? The reason I'm asking this is because at the end of the discussion, we've reserved quite some time for discussion with the audience. And, well, I already saw many people who are either stakeholders or know much about this subject. So please um, prepare your questions or your comments so we can have a fruitful discussion at the end with the audience also. Um, but for now, um, you are at... Uh, Triptych, actually, it's the first edition of Long Live Amsterdam, or in Dutch, Leve Amsterdam. And in this series, we ask foreign thinkers, or people who are not Dutch, to reflect upon issues that uh, appeal to Amsterdam or are important to Amsterdam. Um, so tonight we have Evgeny Morosov. Next month, we'll have sociologist Saskia Sasse. And in December, we will have um, George Ferguson, the former mayor of Bristol. And... Um, the reason I wanted to organize this, or the Bali wanted to organize this, is because uh, of many reasons, because Evgeny Morozov is interesting, but mostly because in March 2018 we'll have municipal elections in Amsterdam, and we're going to do all sorts of debates with um, uh, political leaders. Um, we're going to talk about the uh, housing market, we're going to talk about equality and inequality, but at the same time we sometimes have the feeling that we're talking in a kind of closed circuit. You know, about Amsterdam you have the same people debating the same things, and we thought this would be a nice opportunity to breathe some fresh air in discussions, and we really hope we can get some insights that we can use later when we organize the debates. Um, because when discussing the future of Amsterdam, I think we need to address the role technology plays. Uh, for example, smart technologies that are meant to make life more easy in Amsterdam. Um, who owns and profits from these technologies? Are they for everyone or just for the lucky few? And tonight the focus will be on something that I think underpins the discussions we're having about technology, namely public values. Um, because the public values we share and often ask uh, politicians to uphold um, are also being affected by technologies we invite to the city. For example, um, if you talk about uh, Airbnb or about Uber. Do they reflect the way we want to deal with each other in the city, or is there something that we need to add to technology in order to make it, well, serve the public good, whatever that may be? Um, therefore, our main question tonight will be, how can we shape our public values in, technolo in, in technological times, and subsequently, what role does the local government play, and what role do we, the community citizens, play? Um, so that's why I'm really happy Evgeny Morozov is here. Uh, he will give a keynote speech of about 30 minutes, after which uh, we'll engage in a conversation with researcher Martijn de Waal and with Elderman, which is, and I had to look it up, wethouder 
uh, for Amsterdam, Laurens Evans, and he was the one who, among other things, brokered a deal between the city of Amsterdam and Airbnb. Um, and I will be aided in the panel discussion by René Frisse, who works for the Institute of Public Values and knows, well, quite a lot about the other key word we have tonight besides technology, namely public values. Um, at the end of the evening, as I said, there will be ample room for questions by you. Um, questions are characterized by, well, a slightly higher pitch at the end of the sentence and a question mark. Um, so that's just uh, to notice. And if we do this right, I'll make sure you'll be at the bar at a quarter to ten, so we can engage in the third half, which is maybe just as important. Um, but for now, let's begin with Evgeny Morozov. I think he's shaken up the debate about uh, technology, uh, digital technology for quite some years now. We've had him a few years ago with his book To Save the World, Click Here, in which he argues that political problems cannot be solved with technological solutionism. And he's working right now on an, well, an investigation into the smart city and how that changes our citizenship. So I think this is a story that relates to Amsterdam quite directly and is quite urgent. So I'd like to give the floor to him now. Give him a warm welcome, Evgeny Mozov. Well, uh, good evening, everybody. It's uh, a pleasure to be back uh, to the Bali and also to Amsterdam. You see, that's the first problem that I have. Um, all right, so I've been asked to talk about the relationship between cities and digital technologies. It does not necessarily adapt to the concept of the smart city, by the way. I'm not working on a book about the smart city. I would like to dispel that illusion. I, uh, there are many more exciting things uh, to talk about in the context of technologies and cities that I think have to be present uh, on our radar. I will talk about the smart city, uh, of course, also, but I don't think that that should occupy uh, most of our intellectual bandwidth, uh, so to say. Uh, if you have heard me speak before, you probably know that I tend to speak very fast, and I go on for 45 minutes criticizing everything and everybody, and then uh, people ask me, so what is to be done? And I say, well, sorry, time is up. Um, so uh, this time I'll try to remind myself that we have a larger task uh, ahead of us. Uh, so I will pose that question, what is to be done, at the very beginning of my talk, uh, at least uh, not to forget it. And uh, if you think about that question philosophically, so what is to be done? I think the obvious and very banal answer is that the answer to that question depends very much on how you actually frame the problem. Right? So you can frame a problem very differently, and depending on how you frame it, you'll come up with a very different set of action plans, solutions, and so forth. So when you think about technologies, on the one hand, and cities, on the other, I think it's obvious to us that there are many ways to talk about both. Right? There are a lot of ways to talk about technology. There are ways to talk about it philosophically, for example. We've had a very vibrant debate over the last few decades, if not centuries, about whether technology is making us stupid, whether it's making us more dependent or independent, how it affects morality, law, and so forth. Right? That's, I think, is still the dominant way to talk about technology, and that's a framework that many people, previously also me, uh, have applied uh, to try to understand Silicon Valley, Google, Facebook, Airbnb, Uber, and the rest of it. Uh, I think its framework is useful, but not enough. We need something else. Uh, we need something else grounded in history, grounded in economics, and grounded in a somewhat better geopolitical understanding of how the world of technology works. The same can be said about cities. Right? There are very uh, many various ways to talk about urbanism. Right? You can talk about cities, you can talk about uh, technocratic approaches to cities, you can talk about planners destroying the vibrancy and complexity of self-organizing units. Uh, you can pursue the kind of Jane Jacobs line of celebrating small-scale uh, mixed-use urbanism where uh, the main targets are, again, these technocratic planners that try to rationalize everything. James Scott, for example, does something similar in his book, Seeing Like a State. Uh, that also, I would argue, is an interesting way to talk about cities and urbanism, but it is not enough. You clearly need uh, an approach grounded in history and grounded probably in some understanding of how the global economy works in order to understand what is actually happening in our cities today. You will not be able to explain quite a bit about the real estate prices in Amsterdam by drawing on Jane Jacobs. Uh, as uh, much as it hurts me to say that. You'll be able to explain a little bit, you'll not be able to explain quite a lot. So what I would like to do today is to uh, try to juxtapose and run together these two narratives. 
uh, about technology on the one hand and about cities and urbanism on the other, and try to give you something of a historical and political economic perspective on how I see uh, those two trends and kind of uh, tracks uh, develop uh, from the 1970s onwards, which then I hope uh, will allow us to get a more realistic view of what it is that can be done and should be done. Because again, depending on how you describe the situation now, whether you're grounded in philosophy or morality or concerns about privacy, uh, whether you're grounded in economics and developments in the global market and so forth, you'll come up with a very different action plan. Right? So framing this problem matters, and it matters quite a bit. That's why, for example, I'm so unsatisfied with most critiques of the smart city, because most of the critiques that currently exist they are grounded in a very philosophical, moral reading of the smart city as some kind of creation of the technocrats, right? Creation of people who just want to more or less um, run everything in a very top-down bureaucratic manner, who would like to reduce complexity to numbers, quantify it, and so forth. Uh, it's not incorrect, this reading, but that does not really explain, I would argue, 90% of what's happening in our cities, even with regards to a lot of the smart city models um, and brochures. So uh, let me put one provocative thesis uh, at the beginning of this talk, and then the rest of it will kind of flow from there naturally. So I would argue that quite a lot of our technological and digital world and quite a lot of our urban world that we all experience today can be traced back to a much broader crisis of capitalism that began in the early 70s. So uh, there have been various measures to resolve that crisis. Some of them have worked for some classes, some of them have not worked for other classes, but nonetheless we are living through the consequences of trying to revive and give some more impetus and growth to a system that had run into a crisis from the early 70s onwards. Right? And that, I would argue, explains quite a lot about what's happening now, but it also explains quite a lot about what has happened since 1970s onwards. The crisis, of course, that I'm talking about was the crisis of profitability. It just became much harder for good, hard-working capitalists to earn the rate of return that they were expecting to earn by putting their money into whatever investments they were putting it. Right? We can describe and debate and argue, and a lot of economists are still arguing why that happened. It's not a clear-cut story, uh, but I think the consensus more or less applies across the board, both on the Marxist and non-Marxist side of economics. There was a crisis of capitalism. A capitalist felt threatened whether it had to do with the gains that workers have made in claiming more and more income for themselves, whether it had to do with the success of the welfare state, whether it had to do with the internationalization of the global economy, with Japan and South Korea and Germany contesting uh, the role of the United States. Uh, there are all sorts of factors that can explain it. The reality is that capitalists were no longer earning what they were expecting to earn, and they looked for solutions. Right? And I would argue that the solutions to that crisis of capitalism uh, were threefold. Right? And all of them had to do, more or less, with trying to restore that rate of profit. Right? And solutions were mostly of uh, three types. Right? Uh, they had to do with uh, clearly finding a way to uh, make sure that workers, who previously got quite a good share of all the profit, all the surplus value that was made in the economy through higher and higher wages, and the higher and higher benefits that were distributed them through the welfare state, there was need to be found a way, right? How can you keep them happy while reducing the pile of resources that went to them, right? So how do you make all those people who were expecting to receive a good pay, right, under conditions of seemingly permanent economic growth, under conditions where you could no longer afford to pay them, right? So clearly, you start tinkering and you start finding new and newer ways of, make sure, of actually finding a way to compensate. Right? This is where you can actually notice how speculation and financialization enters the scene. Right? So we are being told from the 1970s onwards that it's not just through wages, right? it's not just through earning a living in the workplace that we can assure our well-being, financial and economic one. It's also by participating actively in the stock markets, in the bond markets, and especially in the uh, property markets. Right? So the assumption is that you can actually become wealthy and sustainable in ways other than work. Right? For that to work, of course, we need to make sure that stock markets keep growing and that uh, real estate and property markets keep growing. Right? So one of the underlying trends that I'm highlighting and pointing out here is the trend towards the financialization of the economy. 
Right? So the assumption was that by financializing, financializing more and more of the economic activity, you would actually be able to restore some of the prosperity and some of the wages to people who could no longer actually earn them in the workplace through all sorts of other secondary compensation, whether through capital gains on the stock market, whether through property gains uh, once they have bought uh, their houses. Right? By the 1990s, uh, that has taken on uh, an even uh, greater framework under the heading of asset-based welfare. So a lot of social democratic parties in Northern Europe, in the United Kingdom and elsewhere have taken on this idea that somehow as the welfare state becomes unsustainable and unaffordable, we can actually make sure that people have incentives built into tax system, property owning system and so forth to buy as many houses as they could, right? Because those houses will appreciate in value if the economy is being capped where it was through low interest rates, so that people would actually feel wealthy even though they were no longer earning just as much money as they did in the workplace. Right? That more or less is the process that we see across the entire Western economy, from the United States to Western Europe. So, and a lot of social democratic forces have taken that on, more or less as the way to make people wealthy in what they then described as the property-owning democracy which was actually a very positive slogan. Uh, another two pillars of kind of restoring this rate of profitability in addition to financialization were what I would call globalization and servitization. Right? And those are just three. So there is financialization, globalization, servitization. So what happened with globalization is a story that you all know. Right? It was trying to find a way to outsource more and more to get lower labor costs on the outside, which explains a lot of the closures of factories, uh, and so forth that we have all experienced in Western Europe and North America. Right? The idea was that you can actually take advantage of labor arbitrage and more or less uh, outsource as much production as possible, thus cut costs by internationalizing production, which did in fact restore quite a bit uh, the profitability rate. Right? And as part of it, uh, we have seen uh, not only the complete restructuring of the urban landscape of many of our cities, which traditionally have been tied to manufacturing and that have been tied to industrial production, but we have also seen uh, a lot of other interventions that did not seem obvious at the time, but in retrospect, we have come to appreciate uh, their um, potency. For example, as part of this push to globalize the economy and internationalize production, uh, there was a huge uh, kind of push towards free and liberalized trade, right? And as part of that, there was a push to actually liberalize trade and things like information and data, right? So you actually had the main players of the economy at the time, which were the Americans, who really tried to engineer a trade regime and a trade environment that would really make it easy for data to travel across borders. So you could take data produced you know, by people in Germany or in Japan and have it processed in America. Right? So you would not face any requirements to process data locally, to store it locally. You would actually be able to take that data, put it outside, store it in America, and more or less make money in America. Right? This is how American banking industry uh, hoped to expand and conquer global markets. Because up until the 1970s, most of the American industries were actually concentrated in America. They were mostly serving domestic markets. And they started internationalizing. They needed this free trade kind of architecture in order to make it easier to enter foreign markets, but also to extract value. Right? So clearly it gave a huge boost to the financial industry. But the reason why I'm mentioning it now is that it also opened the doors to the technological industry and specifically to the uh, data industry, which then managed to free ride on the efforts of the financial industry to liberalize trade in data and essentially trade in services uh, and thus uh, create firms like Google, Uber, and so forth, which essentially are platforms run out of America, but extracting value from the rest of the globe. Right? And the third trend, which I have already hinted at, because I've mentioned this liberalization of trade and services, is what I would call servitization. Right, which basically means that you are transitioning towards an economy very much based on services and no longer based on manufacturing. Right? And what it means is that a lot of companies, for example, like IBM, that have traditionally built their business uh, around selling you hardware products, have realized that, uh, first of all, the costs 
of producing hardware have dropped dramatically, so they could no longer produce the margins that they wanted. And they have shifted towards a model where they would actually be offering services, uh, which are essentially very often to, uh, you know, consulting services of some kind, but they can also be automated services of some kind, where you, know, you purchase insurance, cyber insurance, some kind of optimization service, often even at a subscription fee. So essentially you can convert uh, sales of commodities, which were one-off events, into permanent subscription-based activities so you can go and charge the client on a sustainable basis for a much longer time. So across the economy, starting from finance, but also expanding into more and more domains, including the domain of technology, we have seen the shift towards services. Okay? So, uh, and I would argue, like I'll get to that a bit later, but I would argue nonetheless that the ultimate service that we will see kind of enter and radically transform the global economy will be artificial intelligence. Right? Ultimately, every single sector of the economy will need that service to operate properly and operate competitively and operate efficiently and sustainably. Whether you're talking about energy savings, whether you're talking about transportation, whether you're talking about utility use, more or less the entire sector, right? the entire kind of uh, spectrum of uh, services now can be transformed and optimized with the help of artificial intelligence, which, if you will, is the meta service on which the service economy will be based. Right? And this, I think, is very, it's very important to understand because ultimately the transition to the services-based economy has also allowed to save some of the other problems which capitalism, due to this falling rate of profitability, had encountered from the 1970s onwards. And primarily, it was not just about finding a way to compensate workers with you know, more speculation through stocks, bonds, and property, right? which to some extent explains the real estate situation in most of our Western cities, but it was also about finding ways to make the cost of living cheaper. Right? And I think you should not underestimate the way in which the appearance of hidden data subsidies and hidden technological subsidies from the technology industry has allowed us to more or less do more with less, which actually is the slogan of many firms in Silicon Valley. Now you can actually do more with less because the digitalization of everything right, does produce a lot of savings. And the fact that digitalization so far has been tied and underwritten just by one industry, which was advertising, had allowed us to free ride on digital infrastructure without paying for its full costs. Right? So much of the digital economy that operates now, that gives us a resemblance of robust growth and sustainability, more or less is underwritten by a bunch of advertisers who are subsidizing a lot of communication and connectivity costs. Right? So every time we use Google, every time we use Facebook, every time we use YouTube, Google Scholar, and so forth, right, there is a hidden subsidy hidden there, which means that neither the government nor us have to pay for those services. And since we don't have to pay for those services, you can actually uh, pay people less. Right? It's, a very banal, it's a very banal statement. I often refer to a study that was published by researchers at MIT earlier this year, which actually asked people how much they would need to get paid not to use Google, YouTube, and Google Maps for a year. Right? And the sum total of uh, that number, of those numbers, was around 20,000 euros. So people would, need to not, people would need to get paid 16,000 euros not to use Google for a year. Right? I mean, clearly they asked Western European and North American audience, but nonetheless, the results to me indicate that there is a hidden subsidy built into the system right, with advertising more or less subsidizing a lot of the costs that we would not be able to afford if we were to pay for them either out of the welfare state or out of our own pockets. Or if the debt would feel much poorer as a result. Right? In a sense, uh, it has become a new way of more or less buying time to a system that can no longer guarantee uh, rising living standards, profitability, and so forth. Right? And here I think it's very important to understand that ultimately there is a great interconnection also that exists between the world of technology and the world of uh, cities and real estate. Right? The only person that I know of who has made that connection uh, really explicitly uh, is a British uh, economist and policymaker called Adair Turner, who ran the Financial Supervision Authority in the United Kingdom, which dealt with all of the consequences of the financial crisis. And in his 2015 book, Between That and Devil, he makes a very intriguing argument, uh, where he basically says that the more high-tech and the more digital our economy becomes, 
uh, the more crucial uh, real estate uh, and property development uh, becomes to it. Right, which in some sense is counterintuitive, because you would think that the more material and virtual and digital our economy gets, the less land and things that are material would actually matter. But he makes a very persuasive case in the book, and it's a case that I fully agree with, that ultimately what has happened is that uh, in the last 10 years, right, we have seen the growth of a lot of highly profitable and valuable firms. Right? So if you look at Facebook, if you look at Google, if you look at Amazon and Microsoft, those are firms that are actually the top firms of the entire global economy. So if you look at the list of top 10 firms of market capitalization, seven or eight of them, if not nine, it depends on uh, day by day, actually technology firms, right? 10 years ago, it was just one firm, Microsoft, that was on top 10 list. I double check the figures now, uh, today, and if you add up the total increases in market value of those five firms, Apple, Amazon, Microsoft, Google, and Facebook, right? they have increased in value in, what, 11 months since January by almost a trillion dollars. Right? It's not their total value, it's the increase in their value since January. Right? Do you happen to know the GDP of the Netherlands? It's 770 billion, right? So the value of those five firms has grown by an amount greater than the GDP of the Netherlands right? uh, in, nine, in 11 months, which is tremendous. Right? But if you look at what it took to create those firms, right? how much capital actually went into creating them, how much labor went into creating them, it's actually not a lot. So if you compare how much, you know, man labor and capital labor went into, well, capital whatever, ca capital uh, investment went into creating uh, General Motors or General Electric and compare it to Facebook, the number will be trivial. So in his book, Turner gives a figure of 5,000 man hour software, whatever, hours, uh, is what it took to create Facebook, right? In one way or another, and then of course maintenance updates, it's, it's, it's a kind of, uh, uh, it's an approximation, but nonetheless. So you are dealing with a sector that became huge on very little capital investment, okay? uh, which means that a lot of the spare capital, okay, a lot of the money of people who actually want to invest in something but cannot, does not enter the likes of Facebook and Google, because very little of it is needed, and instead it actually enters the most inelastic and the most secure and the most capitally robust sectors of the economy, which in this case have to do with real estate and land. Right? And there are other arguments that he makes, but I find that line of reasoning very persuasive because it does tell you that an economy that is heavily dependent, particularly on its stock valuations, which is how those of us who have stock actually become rich, because this is how a lot of people in America become rich, right? Those are not rich, at least sustainable rich, right? I mean, this is how you actually get by. You no longer expect to get a paycheck if you work you know, in some industrial town. You invest your savings, you invest your pensions into stocks, and where do you invest now? You invest them in technology stocks. Right? So I mean, clearly, the growth of that sector is fundamental to the idea that capitalism still generates value. If the technology sector does not generate any value, the idea that capitalism is a system that spreads wealth equally and makes all of us in some way or another better off, it's much harder to sell to people. Right, so you actually need the tech sector to be growing as fast as it has been because other sectors are not growing as fast as they did. Right? And of course, the real estate prices are going through the roof, which then creates all sorts of secondary effects right, for all of us. And we feel those secondary effects because we have to pay more in rent. Uh, once you switch from, AI, from advertising-powered digital economy to AI-powered digital economy, you will see all sorts of other secondary effects right? because and this is my prediction and conviction, that you will not have advertising financing all of our digital activities, and a lot of businesses have been built on advertising financing those infrastructures and sensors and whatnot, that will not continue forever. Sooner or later, and this is, you already can read if you, into financial statements of those firms if you monitor them closely, you will discover that more and more of them are trying to build a secondary field in which to land, right? A cushion on which they can land in case advertising markets collapse. For virtually all of them, that secondary field, that kind of safety cushion is AI, 
right? And those are services that will be offered with the help of AI, whether it will be self-driving autonomous drive cars, whether it will be uh, cyber insurance, whether it will be some kind of energy optimization by drawing on tons of data and sensors and so forth. All of that will involve that in one way or another. But once they make that switch, right, it's obvious that somebody will actually have to pay for those services. Right? And those somebody, you know, will, in most cases, will be municipalities, it will be people, it will be users, it will be governments, and so forth. Right? That's why when Google goes and makes the deal with the National Health Service in the UK to analyze the data from millions of patients in order to identify early signs of kidney disease, we can all celebrate it as a new way of doing welfare, because Google is doing it for free, but we should be under no illusion that that will continue being that way, because sooner or later somebody will have to pay. Right? So the main concern I have here is not just concern about privacy of data. The concern that I have actually has to do with the fact that for a lot of us, uh, this kind of parallel digital welfare state that has been built so far and that will be built into the future will not be the free paradise that all of us expect it to be simply because we keep on using Google, Facebook, and all of those other firms without paying. Right? But returning back to the kind of broader subject of cities and uh, technologies together, I think having laid out this framework of financialization, globalization, and servitization, more or less driving right, the dynamics both in technology and in cities, you can see that you can actually explain quite a lot of what's happening now by adopting that framework. You, know, you look at Airbnb. Why is Airbnb so appealing? And why is it so uh, friendly? And why do so many people actually love it? Right? It's very simple, because A, it gives you services that are very cheap if you find yourself on the receiving end of Airbnb services. So if you're a tourist traveling the world, great, it's fantastic. You pay very less, you pay very much less than you would pay to a hotel. You have wider choice, you have a reputation tied to it. Uh, for people who do not make much money, Right? And many of us don't, in part because uh, incomes have been stagnating or actually declining in most of the advanced countries of Western Europe and North America. Something like Airbnb does allow to continue this generation of hidden subsidies, right? essentially through scale and globalization. So by the, through the fact that they're present in so many markets at once, they can, in fact, generate rates um, that will be lower than the rates uh, that you would receive at a hotel. So on the consumer side, it's an opt it's a logical reaction to the fact that our incomes actually getting uh, smaller and smaller actually stagnate. Right? On the side of property owners, this is also fantastic because in some sense or another, it's a way to actually safeguard your future if you can no longer count on the welfare state to finance your pension, which is exactly what many of our parties, especially the social democratic variety, have been promising us and telling us to do for the last 30 or 40 years. The assumption always was that you can treat your house as a cash machine, as an ATM, essentially, and Airbnb just takes that logic to its ultimate conclusion. It just tells you you don't need to wait for five years to realize capital gains on your house. You can realize it on a daily basis by plugging it into a broader kind of flow of tourists that now pass through our cities. Uh, by the way, I mean, if you work with that framework I have outlined carefully, we will also be able to see that tourism itself enters into the picture uh, somewhere in the intersection of you know, globalization and servitization of the economy. Right? So you can explain quite a lot with that framework, I think, including phenomena like tourism. But if you look at Airbnb again, just, just let me restate that, with the framework I have outlined, Airbnb is not presented in any way as a kind of black ship, as a deviation of capitalism that is otherwise working. Airbnb is a very logical consequence of it, and it's actually a very natural kind of derivation of the kind of methods and rhythms and vectors of movement that have been built into this highly financialized, globalized, and servitized uh, capitalism. Right? Uh, the same can be said about many of the initiatives that Google now makes. Right? I mean, as you know, they have uh, a separate unit within Google, or to put it correctly, Alphabet, uh, which is called Sidewalk Labs, right? which is now is all about building and fixing cities. Right? You might have seen that just a couple of weeks ago, they announced a new experiment in Toronto where they actually would like to build an entire neighborhood run and operated by Google. Right? So you'll have garbage collection run by Google, you'll have self-driving kind of public transport run by Google, energy networks, and so forth. Um, again, it looks very interesting. Right? In, on, on paper, it looks very promising to, to many people. Uh, if, if you start reading the fine print uh, closer, you will see that on the Google side, the logic propelling it 
right? It's very simple. It's the logic of data extractivism, right? It's the idea that you can actually come and find ways to uh, leverage thousands and millions of users who sign up to use those services because what other choice do they have since this is an essential part of the infrastructure of living in a city, uh, who then train their AI systems to become smarter and smarter and more and more autonomous. Right? This is how many of Google's products, including their products based on you know, deep learning, have actually uh, become so smart. Right? It's been through finding ways to leverage the work of all of us in order to make them smarter. So to some extent, it's an extension of that broader project of that extractivism, which itself Google has to do because such are the competitive pressures of being in a service industry built around AI with Amazon, Facebook, Microsoft, and a couple of other firms, many of them in China, competing with Google for that market. So there are internal dynamics to this data extractivism, which now make serious natural targets of it. Right? You cannot really explain it just by looking at you know, how cities work and saying that Google is just a bunch of you know, geeks and hackers who just want to enter a space they don't know before and we need to kind of exclude them. That's the wrong way to think about it. You really need to think about systemic pressures and laws of some kind that actually push Google towards urban space because urban space is where data is generated and data is what will determine who is going to win in this uh, service economy based around AI. On the other hand, you can have also a very different perspective on this project in Toronto, because it's obvious that there is a partner to this project. Somebody has to pay for those services. Because again, right now, there is no advertising on them. Uh, data extractivism, in a sense, is not something that can pay for it currently, even though Google, of course, can pay for it if they wanted to. No, they go and sign up actual property developers, you know, and actual you know, big real estate firms, who are the ones who are supposed to finance many of those developments. Right? And that's how it works in many kind of what it's, it's known as greenfield uh, smart city developments. In India, you have hundreds of them. Yes, we can say that the Modi government in India is very technocratic. They want to build 100 smart cities. All of that is true. But the reality is that they're putting a very tiny pot of money on the table right, to offer all those highly digital privatized services. Most of the money is supposed to come from private real estate developers, property developers, and so forth. So many of those smart cities, they have a nice narrative built around technology and information. What actually pays for them is conventional real estate. Right? And they appeal to a certain class of you know, workers working for big multinationals, living in gated communities, and so forth. But ultimately, those are real estate projects. They, of course, are different from cities like Amsterdam, Barcelona, and many others, which uh, clearly are not building new entire cities from the ground. There, I think it would be much more appropriate to think about what has been happening up until now through the perspective of these firms trying to offer more and more services and finding more and more ways to derive revenue from uh, cities, municipalities, and so forth. So it's obvious that cities having lost that tax base because factories have left, tax laws have changed, capital has become much more mobile, tourism no longer compensates for the uh, revenues that have been lost due to globalization. What are cities supposed to do? Cities are supposed to run on a greatly limited or reduced budget, and it's very hard to deal with problems caused by tourism, caused by climate change, caused by rising real estate values on a limited budget. So what is it that you're supposed to do as a city manager? You're supposed to find a way to optimize resources. How do you optimize resources? You optimize them through digitization. Right? And this, I think, is what explains why you see almost a natural affinity between many municipalities and the services of managing one part of resource or another that are being pitched to them by uh, these big multinational firms. Right? And you don't necessarily have uh, Google in mind. You can think about Cisco. You can think about Microsoft. These are very often traditional services firms that come and want to have a lucrative government contract, essentially, that will guarantee them a revenue stream for running one piece of infrastructure, collecting one piece of data, analyzing another piece of data, and giving government the ability to cut costs on some elements of the system while greatly increasing them on others, right? which will mostly be IT costs. Right? So uh, the, the, the kind of magic promise there is that you can cut enough costs by optimizing use of your resources to pay for the IT costs that you will then have to pay to Cisco and the rest of it. Uh, very often, it doesn't work that way. Because those are legacy systems. They come with their own costs. They're very hard to make interoperable and so forth. Right? So the magic story about IT driving all those savings is very often not correct. So I'm going to wrap up in the next four or five minutes, maybe less. But 
because I promised to give you some positive vision of what's to be done. But nonetheless, I think without having this kind of broader historical analytical perspective on what drives both technology and what drives cities, it's very hard to come up with reasonable interventions. Right? Because you clearly would see that on the one hand, cities are almost powerless to do anything here because problems are clearly caused at the high level of analysis. They are caused at the level of the nation state, even European Union and so forth. So it would be naive to expect cities to be able to fix uh, you know, problems like the absence of industrial strategy for most European states. Like, it's not something that the city of Amsterdam can fix. It's something that has to be fixed at the national level. Nonetheless, I think we can identify where some of the weakest points Right? In this new system built around things like real estate speculation on the one hand, a very traditional old school type of activity, and new types of activities like data extractivism that I have identified before. Right? You can still identify some of the crucial points and interventions. With regards to something like data extractivism, it's obvious that if you can articulate a very different vision for data ownership right? at the level of the city, you can actually end up with a somewhat different set of experiments, but maybe even existing projects that will not result in a couple of big firms essentially eating all of your public uh, municipal data in order to spew out even more services that will be proprietary and for which you'll have to pay. Like we need to find a way in which data we produce in cities as citizens can actually contribute to resources that are public, that are robust, that are highly efficient, that are highly decentralized, but they can actually then be harvested as part of a broader infrastructure, like AI. Right? This is what the artificial intelligence will be in the next five, 10 years, it will be infrastructure. It will underpin all the other sectors of the economy. You can either live it in private hands, in which can you'll end up with some kind of a private toll road system for artificial intelligence where everybody will have to pay. You can have a public road system for AI, but will not have to pay and will actually be using it to increase our well-being, economic activity, and so forth. At the level of the cities, some of those early interventions into how that system will look like, whether it will be fully privatized or whether it will actually be public, can still be made. Right? If you can articulate a right set of licenses for other ownership, you can actually create some pots of money within the city to invest in the alternative system. You can then tie to various academic resources that exist in many cities with expertise on artificial intelligence, with expertise on supercomputing and so forth. Right? So all of that, I think, can be done, but it will only be done if we have policymakers with a robust understanding of where the economy itself is going both nationally and globally. Without having that understanding, it will be very hard to explain why data matters. Because people, I think, do not realize that data at this point is one of the most valuable resources, not because it's data and it has some kind of identifiable information to pitch you to advertisers, but because data is the resource that drives the creation of artificial intelligence. I'm absolutely convinced about that. And unless you manage to find a way to own and run it differently, you will not go very far. So this is just one very simple intervention cities can do. Intervention number two, think about how you can actually tap into things like 3D printers, maker communities, and so forth, to bring back some of the production that has now left and ended up in Cambodia, Vietnam, China, or somewhere else. Right? There is a trend, I think, and the trend might actually accelerate, of trying to bring some of the production back, because again, with more and more automation, and with newer and newer models built around things like 3D printers and maker communities, you can actually make a difference uh, that will reverse some of those trends. And that will actually result in our cities not just being some kind of symmetries or factories, or some kind of creative labs, which is, you know, is another kind of extremity that a lot of our policymakers celebrate, but that will actually have some robust things being done and built and made and manufactured locally. That will not just be done by celebrating makers or you know, opening up uh, 3D printing shops. Right? There needs to be, again, some kind of an industrial strategy that will tie to education, that will tie to the rest of the economy. There needs to be some subsidies, there need to be some strategic interventions going to those places in order to make sure that it's not just some kind kind of artisanal production of things that do not matter, and that essentially become some kind of you know, trinkets you buy in a souvenir shop, they will actually be a robust chunk of the local economy. Right? And um, I think that is, in one way or another, essential. And the third part is that I didn't really get to talk about infrastructure much, but infrastructure has become as essential as real estate, as a source of investment for many of these big financial speculators who are essentially looking upon infrastructure as a way to generate stable returns in an economy that, due to low interest rates, no longer delivers the return that pension funds and many other investors are looking for. So it's very important 
to think about not letting infrastructure become even more privatized. Right? Because I think without having some basic control over it, nothing will be possible in cities. Right? And you see that more and more of that infrastructure, from airports to parking spots to roads to you, know, you name it, is being taken over. And I think it's not a very healthy trend. So we have to problematize that issue, but we have to problematize it in a way that can actually offer alternative ways, not just of controlling it, but perhaps even of funding it. This is where I think there is some space for experimentation of, with a combination of technologies like crowdfunding and the blockchain. I know I might sound very <coughs> techno-utopian at this point, but I do think that there are alternatives to bond markets, for example, funding infrastructure. Right? Those alternatives have not been tapped. But there are ways in which all of us, in one way or another, can contribute something to building the infrastructure that we all use. Uh, it might happen in a way that might also even bring us a little bit of return that's justifiable and is justifiable into any bond scheme. And you can actually have technologies like the blockchain moderating uh, some of the trust issues that have traditionally been tackled by bond rating agencies, right? which create their own problems and got us into a lot of problems uh, in the wake of the financial crisis. So we do need to experiment with these new technologies of determining and verifying trust, right? linking them to new ways of raising money linking them to the actual needs coming from the community in order to build infrastructures that are robust and that are not controlled by foreign investors or pension funds that you know you might all enjoy being in Holland, the fact that your pension funds invest in infrastructure abroad. If you find yourself on the receiving side of those investments, you might not actually like it because you will actually have to pay higher and higher fees to uh, bring the desired yield to the pension funds that invest in that infrastructure. That's why Canadians, being as smart as they are, never allow their own pension funds to invest in Canadian infrastructure. You know why? Because Canadians know that once pension funds take over infrastructure, things usually get worse for these users, because <laughs> they end up paying more to uh, bring the desired returns. So we have to be very smart and strategic here. I think there are lots of technologies on the table. I have uh, outlined many of them. Blockchain, 3D printers, crowdfunding, a new way of data ownership, new kinds of data licenses, all of them are available. If we put them together in the right way, if we have the right vision that is geopolitical and economic at the same time, we will actually be able to offer an alternative. If we don't, my fear is that we'll end up run by the likes of Alphabet with the urban labs, so by the likes of Amazon, Microsoft, and Facebook. In this case, the valuations will keep rising and rising. Thank you so much. Good to see that. Oh, if you take that one, the, the one, sure. yeah. Um, thank you, Evgeny. I, I, I was before asking the panel. We are in Amsterdam here, and you described quite eloquently, I think, that cities are working with limited resources. They want to optimize. No, they're working with limited budgets. They want to optimize mm -hmm. their resources, and so they turn to uh, digital answers that are efficient, easy, and that can help them with that. And you also outlined a sort of historical story of. Um, the, the, the financial triggers, the, the, the mm -hmm. system that enabled the situation where we are right now mm -hmm. to exist. How would you say, before we turn to the panel, that, for example, a city um, stands right now just as Amsterdam, because this is a struggle for power, right? Yes. So if, you, if we're pushing and pulling as a city against those technological innovations, mm -hmm. are we past the thresholds that we already um, have no control over our public values and our democratic realm? Or, or can we still fight back? Well, I think you know, th th there is still quite a lot of fighting back that's possible. Uh, again, I do not buy into some kind of very dystopian, pessimistic picture that all we can do is just exit and uh, th 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 not participate in, in the political life altogether. I think you have to identify precisely those weak spots. Mm. But you have to identify those weak spots where, you know, <laughs> where capital might respond in, in a way that will grant you some concessions. It might actually allow you to occupy spaces that were previously filled by you know, its own logic. But it has to be done with some leverage. Right? Yeah. So you need to have some leverage. And that leverage might come from various sources. It might come from having a lot of people on your side. So you, know, you have a social movement of some kind. Uh, in which case, uh, you are as good as your ability to affect uh, and disrupt their business flow. But don't we you know, if, you are, if you want to take over a cloud computing center that is located in San Francisco and powers all of your infrastructure, there is no way for you to do it locally in Amsterdam because all of your cloud computing is done there. Right? It's much easier for you to take over a building that belongs to a big financial speculator like 
Blackstone yeah. because that stuff is still kept locally, right? And this is where I think we have to be, that, that also should trigger a lot of thinking in our heads, like how much leverage do we want to lose as we further digitize? Because if you don't have any data localization laws, mm -hmm. if you allow all of your data to be stored abroad, if you allow all of your data processing and computing to be done abroad, you also have no leverage over them. Yeah, yeah. Right? So I mean, there are, like, we, you, you, you have to think about leverage and how we build it. And unfortunately, as digital as we are, a lot of that leverage is still has to do with physical resources and yeah. physical constraints. But for example, if we make this more concrete, yes. the leverage a city like Amsterdam has would be like, we still control our roads, right? I hope. We still have something to say about um, social housing, for example. The, the well, not positive things, but yes, okay. So You've mostly been selling it and privatizing yeah, it, yeah, as far okay, as I sure. know. But, 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 but if we talk about the leverage um, the, 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 the local government has, that has been negotiating with uh, organizations like Uber, like Airbnb, yes. and those are in the fiscal realm, what would be the most, most important asset we have? Well, I mean, having the Netherlands negotiate in the fiscal realm sounds like a joke. I mean, you've kind of <laughs> lost your leverage in that field by becoming a tax paradise of some sort. But yeah. uh, uh, so that is a leverage that has been lost, I'm afraid. But I mean, look, um, all depends on the size of your economy. It's, it's not you, you're not since those companies are international globalized platforms. For some of them, you are key and crucial. Amsterdam might be crucial to Airbnb since it's probably one of the top five cities in Europe by tourist revenue, it might not be crucial to many other firms because since they are global, yeah, since they are present more or less in 100 something countries in the globe, you either take their conditions or they leave. Yeah. Right? And this is where I'm afraid I don't want to give you an illusion of excessive leverage that you have because they might in fact leave. Uh, I think that they will probably make more compromises that you realize because you can make certain demands on them that they will probably meet if you push them far enough. You know, you can specify that they should do certain things with data, for example, as you sign uh, mm. contract agreements with them. Right? You don't know how far they would go, uh, but you can try. Which was uh, done in Amsterdam with Airbnb. For sure, 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 yeah. sure. I mean, there are also, as I hear, you know, there are all sorts of other restraints and constraints standing in the way, data protection and e-commerce legislation coming from the European Commission and so forth that might not even uh, allow them to share that data. But I think there are ways for you to push and see how they will react. Yeah. But you also have to be prepared to have a narrative. This is where I think not having a narrative uh, hurts. You cannot, how should I put it? All of them are very clever in terms of generating publicity for what they do. All of them are also very clever for all of the structural factors I have outlined uh, in mobilizing a lot of middle classes and upper middle classes hmm. who are either consumers or users of their services yeah. because they own houses or they use Uber, they are very good at mobilizing them as their constituents. Yeah. Right? And they are very good at mobilizing their platforms to uh, gather that support. They will send text messages, they will use the app. Uber has done it repeatedly with cities. Facebook has done it repeatedly with governments. This is where you have to be able to tell a story about what it is that you do that is not, uh, that, will not feed, that will not feed into the highly technophobic kind of view of the world that they would present when they talk about mm. public authorities. Because they think that the reason why you would like to intervene is because you are against technology and innovation. Like when I'm against Uber, I'm against a company that's one of the most financialized companies in the world, having raised money from every single sovereign wealth fund that had money available. You know, they raised $3 billion yeah. from Saudi Arabia. Saudi You're not against fund. taxes. The, no, no, but like here, you have to say that here we're not against technology. We are against global capital yeah. chasing the yield, yeah. as they say in the financial industry, this is why big sovereign wealth fund invents in Doomber. Yeah. So I'm against Saudi Arabia expropriating the value that was previously here shared with the local economy. I'm against that. I'm not against progress. Yeah. Yeah. You made that point quite eloquently. I think we should ask some more people to the discussion. Sure. So I'd first like to invite uh, Martijn de Waal to come to the stage. He is a writer and researcher focusing on the relation between the digital and the public. And last year he co-authored this book, The Platform Society. Um, which, is, um, the, which, which explores the way public values can be safeguarded in a world where social, economic and civic interaction is increasingly mediated by digital platforms. Do I say it correctly? That's right. Good. Um, I'd also like to invite Alderman uh, Wethouder, uh, Laurens Evans, to the stage. And one of his focuses is the housing market. And also he brokered a deal between the city and Airbnb. 
and he's also a member of the Socialist Party, so not a social democrat, which has been often referred to by Yevgeny. And he's also their leader in the coming municipal elections. And lastly, I'd like to invite René Frisse, who's going to help me hosting this panel. And in her work as researcher for the Institute of Public Values, she not only researches, but also tries to translate her research into action. She founded, for example, Open Embassy, a place where fruit technology, refugees arriving in the Netherlands are helped by a 24-7 online help desk. And she's an expert on public values, uh, René Frisse. Um, so let's ju just do a quick round across the table. Uh, Martijn, Yevgeny tells us that cities are more and more well uh, owned maybe by technological companies. Um, do you share this view? And if you talk about public values, do you see examples in Amsterdam where um, public values are under threat by companies such as Uber, Airbnb? Yeah, well, let's take the first question uh, first. Now, I think I share a lot of, uh, of, of, of sort of the arguments that, uh, that Afghani uh, just made. And I think one of the, the central things in, in his talk right now that I wrote down is uh, this idea of artificial intelligence becoming uh, sort of the, the ultimate service. Uh, and, and that's what we see in a lot of uh, what we call in the book uh, the rise of the platform society, that a lot of, of uh, all kinds of activities, like ordering a taxi, um, you know, or uh, <coughs> getting a job, ordering a pizza, et cetera, et cetera, is being platformized, right? Mm. You do it through a platform. Um, and the artificial intelligence is sort of the key element in, in the organization in uh, sort of bringing demand and supply um, uh, together uh, uh, there. Um, and um, the problem, of course, there is that that artificial intelligence is really a black box, right? We don't know uh, how it works, right? If we mm. order a taxi for Uber, um, huh, they can tell us uh, all, all the world that they are really there to really uh, do a better job for us, but we don't really know if they're yeah. optimizing their own profit or whether they're really uh, making transport more accessible for for everybody. Um, so I think I think that's sort of an um, that's that's an important point um, uh, that he made. Um, and um, and I, sh I, th I think what's in, in interesting is that he, he combines it to financialization, right? And um, in our book, we also describe that um, uh, one of the problems is that um, it, the, the way that innovation uh, nowadays is also organized is that it gets these huge investments from uh, venture capital, pension funds, Saudi Arabia, et cetera, et cetera, to build these platforms uh, uh, with the artificial intelligence. Um, and that means that a profit can only be made if somewhere at the center of all those interactions, you can extract some value, yeah. right? So the way that our innovation is organized economically um, automatically leads to do or favors those kind of platforms rather than maybe some sort of the, the local platform. So if you were to invent like a local platform for your head that you run as a cooperative for your own local uh, taxi app, it's very hard to get investments for that uh, because there is, and, and that's of course the point for building such an alternative, there is no central point yeah. where you can sort of extract. But what's at stake for us in Amsterdam now, if you hear this story? Um, well, what's at stake is, is the way that, well, for example, if you look at, at transport, right, the organization of transport is related to lots of public values, like is it accessible, is it affordable, what's the quality? Uh, and we have all kinds of traditional ways of, of, of organizing that, right? We, we have sort of a taxi meter with set prices uh, to make sure mm. that, it's, that it's affordable, uh, there is all these quality checks, and so you can debate whether they're good or not. Um, and Uber <coughs> says we're going to do it in a very different way, right? We don't need your regulation anymore. We have uh, trust mechanisms uh, and we have algorithms to do that. Um, but we don't really know if we can trust us, right? And, um, and, and um, uh, uh, moving from um, uh, uh, the system that we have to sort of this different system also means other ways of, for example, organizing labor. Right? For example, there are cities now, not Amsterdam, but cities in Canada, they say, okay, let's stop with organizing our public transport ourselves, we will just subsidize Uber. Uh, for people to take trips. Well, if you make that shift, that means that a lot of sort of uh, public values that were installed in sort of the original system might now disappear. First of all, uh, as it is right now, Uber is, is still more expensive than, than traditional public transport. It's not as accessible. Uh, there is no uh, access for people in wheelchairs, et cetera, et cetera. You need a credit card, et cetera, so a lot of people cannot use it. But it also means that people formerly in the public transport uh, who, were, who were having earning sort of a steady living wage and they were sort of officially employed are now being supplemented yeah. by freelancers. Yeah. So if you move from one system to the other system, you bring in a whole different set of 
of values, yeah. right? And um, and depending on which political perspective you take, you would say that undermines traditional public values yeah. as we've known yeah. them. Um, René, I've asked you to be my uh, co-moderator tonight, and um, you work at the Institute of Public Affairs, are often dealing with talk like this. Um, we talk about public values, but maybe you can give us a short glimpse of what are public values and what would be the most interesting question we could address with regard to Amsterdam right now. Yeah, sure. But to keep it simple, in terms of public values, I think for tonight it's interesting to look at it at, at the values we together as a society have uh, that sort of demonstrate how we want to live together. And the core and the center of this is that these are values that are more than just your personal values. So there are the public values are always the shared values that protect the, all the minorities together. So it, in essence, it sort of represents that the way we want to have a democracy is that we want it to be a collective of minorities and not the majority saying what we want to do. This is, of course, uh, the opposite of how technology works, where the majority is always sort of seen as the best answer. And, but I, I agree with uh, Evgeny that that maybe is not the most interesting discussion for tonight in terms of framing. Because um, if I look at, if I react to your speech, mm -hmm. what I hear is that data independency is very important. Um, and that we are going two ways in this debate. Like first we have a reactive strategy where we ask how does the city react to these companies are miles ahead in terms of data collecting and data processing. Um, and how do we actually, yeah, that would be my question, because I think I would focus mainly on you tonight. Um, <laughs> uh, what, are, what, are, what are you doing to protect our citizens uh, from these data-driven disruptive companies that, have, that do not share the public values as we created them? Uh, but then I would also be very interested in the proactive way in terms of how, uh, if we become, let's say, we become data independent and we are able to uh, get all the uh, programming uh, nerds and talents to, to work for the municipality and that you know that all the best talents work there then what so we collect data for what because i encounter a lot of governments local governments and they do own quite a share of data uh, especially the ones that we need to protect our public values but data is nothing. So that's always what I try to teach the governments. Like if you have data, you have nothing. You need to turn it into information. And from information, you have to distract knowledge. And these two steps are quite important in order to be able to, be, to govern. So my question would, would be, um, do you actually know what data you need to collect to actually protect our public values? So what is the bigger narrative of your, of your values so you know what data you need to collect? And then we don't even touch upon the question about how do you protect then the citizens of which you collect the data. So let's, let's not even go there, but just ask the question, Gemeente Amsterdam, do you actually know what data you need to collect to be independent and to be able to keep control over your public values? Yeah. Yeah. Maybe we, we can directly go to you, Mr. Evans, and maybe you can just make it as concrete as possible. You work in the municipality of Amsterdam, you encounter these issues every day. What does it mean to be an elder man and deal with technology nowadays in Amsterdam? And maybe then you can go to René's follow-up. I'm, I'm very glad with the, uh, the presentation you uh, just had because it's, it is important that we see if people from Amsterdam, I, I think nobody uh, is uh, uh, complaining anymore if they have to pay their local taxes. So that's uh, uh, one main advantage of what you uh, told us today. Um, but more uh, seriously, the, um, you told us if we, want, we think something is very important in our society, then we have to maintain it and have to keep it in uh, public hands. I think that's a very important uh, lesson, you learners. Uh, so we have to keep those social houses. We have to keep the infrastructure. We have to keep our public transport. Those are things we still have here in Amsterdam. So let's keep it and not sell it for the highest price uh, mm. and, and then be dependent on uh, the bigger companies. So I think that's one of the main targets. Um, if we see, you see how everything's changing. You described this thing uh, very, very good, but you also um, described the uncertainty of how things are going to uh, um, be in the future. You, you mentioned the lending cushion. We mm -hmm. don't know what lending cushion, what, where it's exactly is the, the lending this, uh, cushion. And that's, of course, the answer to your question. Of course, the city of Amsterdam doesn't know which data we have to collect. We, are not, we don't know where we are going exactly. But there's one thing 
I'm very concerned about. It's sometimes even impossible to collect the data we need to collect. I had some negotiations with, uh, with the big company Airbnb, uh, and people in Amsterdam have no problem of giving every information about the house to Airbnb. So it goes around the world, it goes to San Francisco, it goes to, 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 to the other uh, headquarters, but they are not allowed to give that information, they, uh, Airbnb, are not allowed to give that information to our municipality. Mm -hmm. So that's, I think it's strange. That's information from our neighborhoods, from our citizens, and we can give it to the big companies, but we are not allowed to give it, those companies are not allowed to give it to the city. And when we had the compulsory registration about uh, 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 the holiday rental, we have that since uh, the 1st of October, you see there are some people who are saying, okay, but that's strange. Why do I have to tell the city government what I'm doing? Well, you are telling everything to a big company far, far away. Why aren't you telling to the city government but, just but when, what Maybe that's because the, the government is interested in public value and doesn't want to extract the data from all its citizens while companies are not involved with that public debate. Well, I, th I think the government wants everything they, they, they can have. Well, of course, you want to collect data uh, and you have to make information out of it, I totally agree. We have a very big database here in, in, in Amsterdam. We have a division, our own uh, uh, investigators, on the and statistic, our own uh, department for it. So we have a lot of data. But the question is, what do we want to get out of those data? And that's, I think, in, when it concerns the, the, the housing market, I want to see a lot of things out of the data. I want to see how prices are rising beca just because people are mm. not in their houses. People yeah. think they can uh, earn more money when they are selling their houses. I want to see a lot of those data because I can learn of it and I can go to the national government and, and tell them, OK, let's keep fixed prices. Let's regulate something more. Yeah, yeah. Evgeny, I, I saw you look a bit diff difficult when listening. <laughs> To Laurens. <laughs> no, no, no. I actually had uh, quite enjoyed his intervention. <laughs> no, no, I wasn't looking difficult. No, no. Okay. Um, I wanted to touch upon um, something that you said to me in the conversation before, and I think it it makes the example a bit more concrete because it deals with public health. You you said to me you have a company like Uber, and they are not a taxi company. They don't present themselves as a taxi company, which means that they. Uh, apply or, or fall under different regulations so they don't have to uh, pay the same taxes that a taxi company would and you said that for example that means that um, um, some taxes that are used to help the disabled in Amsterdam to get cheaper taxi rides um, are usually being paid by the taxi companies but not by uber can we say that this is the essence of what we're talking about that there are people presenting themselves as one thing Namely, the well, companies. Well, yeah, th th that, that's one of the that's one of the, the the problems, right? That all those platforms they say, uh, no, we're not a taxi company, no, we're not a hospitality company, no, we're not an employer. We're just a connector on sort of a matter level, and we're a neutral platform, right? And because we are that, all the the regular laws that that uh, uh, that apply to sort of the people who are in that field do not apply to us. And the example that that uh, that I gave you earlier was actually from New York. Uh, they are all regular taxis. They have to pay 30 cents. Uh, tax uh, on top of every right, and that money is pooled, and that's being used uh, have for uh, public value. Uh, ensure that also disabled people are being able to get a cap, so as a special cap will come. Uber says, no, we're not a taxi company, so we don't pay that. So basically, what they're doing is just saying, oh, we don't belong to the sector. We don't take any responsibility for that. We're just an organizer. We take the profit, but all the sort of the public values are being offloaded to. I don't know, mm. some other parties, right? So that's then probably the government that then has to, to, to pay for that. So I think that's, that's one of the problems uh, that, that, is, that is part of the platform society, uh, that, that those platforms shun away from their responsibilities for a particular sector. Yeah. Maybe because I feel uh, it's, it's quite a difficult to focus this discussion on how we can um, relate Amsterdam to technology. So maybe Yevgeny and then afterwards we can go to uh, Laurens Evans. We are, we, are, we are doing this in the run-up to the municipal elections. I think you've had a fair point saying you should look bigger. It's about the system that 
of the system of financialization that needs to change. And at the local level, it's difficult to address the issues we're talking about. But if you would be in, in, in Lauren's footsteps for mm -hmm. Amsterdam, for example, yeah. how would you proceed in creating a healthy environment for technologies and cities so that we and serve the public good, or at least defend public values, mm -hmm. and combine the, the technologies that we want to innovate or... Mm -hmm. um, well, I think here, again, you know, you can list a, a long number of kind of target interventions, but ultimately I think you need to work on themes, right? So you need to have a thematic approach. So certain subjects like that are sovereignty, for example, technological sovereignty of a city. For me, that might be a very interesting thematic issue that a city can embrace and then understand how on the ground you can actually implement it. How can you make sure that, for example, the data produced by citizens in the city of Amsterdam, not necessarily in their bedrooms, but as they conserve and they consume and uh, use public services, how can that data uh, contribute to the local digital data economy of Amsterdam and not to the local digital economy of San Francisco? Right? So the question of how do you reorient digital economy from this one-way flow you know, I mean, Americans used to talk about the free flow of information. That was at the heart of the trade policy from 1980s onwards. They always forgot to mention that they actually meant free flow of information to the United States, uh, <laughs> right? Which I think it's time for us to wake up and realize that there are certain trade elements that favor certain vectors <laughs> in which information travels, and we need to reverse those vectors, right? So if you can think of laws, if you can think of new data licenses, you know, ownership licenses, which will make it easier uh, for not only to retain that data locally and to kind of slow down its circulation and uh, seeping out of the country, but also you can actually match it up with a targeted set of, I don't know, subsidies or some kind of support, right, to nurture a local ecosystem to do something with that data, right? It, it doesn't have to be AI, even though it might be actually interesting for a city like Amsterdam to explore what are some of the other cities that find themselves in a similar situation and how you can actually internationally and how you can actually pull resources together to work on ambitious uh, initiatives like artificial intelligence. Again, one city will not handle it. Five cities that actually decide to have full autonomy and sovereignty on the question of AI underpinning the rest of the economy actually can make quite a lot of stride because you have resources, you have the talent, you can actually have a targeted long-term program of how you're going to do that. Uh, again, that requires taking a certain skeptical view of the ability of the private sector, and in this case of most of the digital American economy, uh, to deliver those goods without causing much harm. So, and you cannot have that critique, so to say, without having a broader reading of the global economy. That's why, you know, I was so, <coughs> that's why I insisted so much at the very beginning of my talk to situate it in some global uh, view of where the world is heading, because your main challenge, I think, standing in your path, will be deflating this highly utopian narrative that promises us cities where things and goods and services are free or cheap because they're underwritten and subsidized by data, where everybody is an entrepreneur and a creative type working flexible hours, where you, know, you can get anything that you want, you don't need to own anything because everything will be shared, and we'll all be healthy because Google will be monitoring our sleeping rates and so forth. That's the narrative you're working against, and you have to find holes in that narrative. And you have to essentially argue as to why this is not a realistic picture. I mean, I can tell you why I think it's not a realistic picture based on my mm. analysis of this yeah, just yeah, not yeah. being financially sustainable, that not being economically sustainable, that producing all sorts of externalities and secondary effects that these companies currently do not account for. Uber might seem cheap right now because they have the Saudi wealth fund behind them and they can lose quite a lot of money. Once those investors demand their money back, Rates will problem. rise. Yeah. Rates will either rise or drivers will be replaced by AI, in which case local jobs will disappear. Yeah. <laughs> but let's go back like, one step back to you said that the, the cities working together to see where you can cooperate. This presupposes that the cities have a very clear ambition, that they really have a very clear narrative of where they want to stand. It has yes. a presupposition that they know what kind of ethics they want to. Uh, uh, it's not just uh, ethics, it's ideologically. There has to be 
Like no, you but have I to think I would like to the, ask the people the from Amsterdam, like, to, yeah. to, with how do events, like, if we take it one step back, do you, you said like, uh, I don't know where we're going as a city of Amsterdam. I wouldn't say that, you know, with the upcoming elections, it's like, it's good, you have to have <laughs> I, li I like to be but, honest. Uh. Uh, okay, well, that's, um, but let's hope there's, uh, there are some people there that have some kind of vision about where they want to go in terms of data-driven technology versus ethics and values. What it, do, can you give us some examples of what discussions you have uh, at the Gemeentehuis about, this is where we want to go, these are the ethics, this is how, Please tell me it's not only oh, reactive. Please, please don't think that we are the city uh, council are saying which direction Amsterdam is going. <laughs> so the most important thing is that not people in the city council say which direction Amsterdam is going. The people in Amsterdam have to tell us which direction mm -hmm. we want to go and which city we want to have. And that's the most important thing. I think we will never, as people in Amsterdam, allow that some <coughs> certain public goods are being uh, t taken away from us. I'm very proud. That's why I, 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 I'm glad what you told us. We have to. Um, no, but to, to, let, to let, those, let me those, interrupt those because I appreciate this political answer. I appreciate that you want to give us as many powers as possible. And I, and, I, and I do think that in Amsterdam, I'm not making a joke, I do think that in the Netherlands and Amsterdam, that is a clear ambition. However, you are the persons that have the governance. You, have, you are the persons who have to control the checks and balances. We cannot do that. So how are the checks and balances installed in this political democratic process if we encounter data? So I, I, st I don't think you have to wait until we say where well, we want to go with no, technology. So just, just maybe uh, <laughs> I, I wanted to uh, elaborate that the people in Amsterdam are the mainly saying which direction we have to go. I'm the uh, responsible elderman of housing here in Amsterdam. And when I started here in 2014, nobody expected that holiday rental was such a big um, uh, item here in our city. The people in Amsterdam were very clear that we don't want houses, that they just have an, a property value, um, uh, that everybody's making money out of their own uh, apartment, just as an earning uh, uh, thing. We want to keep the houses to be uh, occupied by people who live there. That's what Amsterdam said. And that's exactly what I, as an older man, all, uh, also said. And the thing we managed to achieve is that we, together, the people from Amsterdam and the city council, uh, went to Airbnb and told Airbnb, OK, that's exactly what you told us. Uh, we have a good position because if you want to, uh, to have this uh, so a, a, a joyful uh, mm -hmm. thing that Airbnb is, they think it's joyful uh, at, at that company, um, if you want to keep it, mm -hmm. then you have to deliver. So the strength here in Amsterdam is not that we, have only, um, we are only thinking about what is the direction we are going, we are also doing something but, about but, it and that's what we do with the people in Amsterdam that's what we have achieved with Airbnb yeah. already but, but, and but then I think the question is do more. what is the learning curve because uh, you've now experienced with Airbnb that you can th achieve a lot yes that you can achieve a lot of course of course you can achieve a lot and uh, you can achieve a lot when uh, the people uh, when you are together and uh, saying as a city as the citizens of a city what you want um, and we haven't achieved enough with Airbnb, of course. You mm. already see there are still 70,000 apartments. A lot of them are uh, illegal. Uh, so there are a lot of problems still. But we can see that if the people in Amsterdam want something, you can achieve a lot. So I think that's the strength. And you told us just a, a couple of things where you said uh, that's the promising message. I think the most promising message is let's together yeah. maintain our yeah. city and, and together say which direction we want to go. I, I think because we have so many expertise in the hall, we should also get to questions. So you wanted to add something and then we go. <laughs> I could hear, I just let Martijn finish his sentence and then I come to you, miss. Well, um, to, uh, back to the question of, of what can you do as a government. I think as a government, uh, you have three different um, 
roles you can take. You're of course a regulator, so you can you can regulate technologies. You're a user of technology, so you can pick which platforms uh, yourself you want to use or want to um, engage with. Um, and you can also build platforms, right? And maybe building platforms is more something you want to do um, on a national level than on a local level. And you don't have to build complete platforms, but you can also build parts of platforms. Uh, for example, there is some discussion now on whether or not the national government should build uh, a software taxi meter, right, that then all the transport network companies can use. Um, and of course, the advantage is that if you build, as a government, if you build that taxi meter, then you immediately have access to that data that is being controlled by all the, the, the network companies. And you can use that data not so much to spy on them, but to see whether, to what extent, uh, they, um, uh, they really serve all areas in the cities, or uh, uh, you can use that data maybe to also give it to your transportation, your public transportation company yeah. to sort of change. Uh, so you, there is all kinds of places where you can intervene um, in the system. I think there's a question for you. Yes. Uh, um, am I on? Yeah. Um, Mr. Uh, Morozov, thank you very much for taking us back all the way to the 70s, to the heart of the problem, which is financial. The elderman here is asking you for advice, and please can you advise him on the following? There is something happening here for in the coming decades here in Amsterdam. 50,000 new houses mm -hmm. will be built. Already, financial companies from all over the world are banging on the windows. Please, please, please let me in. This is an asset the city of Amsterdam has. How to deal with this wisely? Because Right now, they have made a plan without any provision or structure or, or limitation on how it should be financed. Please Good tell question. the elderman how to save Amsterdam <laughs> from yeah, yeah. the Saudis. Yeah. You said it. Evgeny. Yeah. You want me to respond? Yes. Um, well, you know, I wish, you know, if I had the answer, I would be a very rich man now, uh, pitching the solution to every city. I mean, essentially, cities have lost leverage having lost their tax base. And since they no longer can afford to finance much, most of those developments, they have to do something that is very odd. They have to assume a lot of the risks uh, of those property developments, uh, while the capital and essentially the returns uh, then get ripped uh, by the private sector. Uh, that the, it's the model that has financed most of the schemes from uh, you know, business improvement districts to privately financed uh, initiatives in the UK and elsewhere. Unfortunately, uh, you have to find your leverage. And your leverage at this point, uh, I do not really see it because you are, and most cities now, back them for money because the housing problem is real. And again, I wish I could tell you what it is that you can do, but I have a very hard time understanding what the leverage is other than trying to pit them against each other, which you know, is to some extent what most cities have tried to do, but it's not particularly winning strategy in the long term. Again, the, the, the reality is that all you can do to influence the prices of housing are two things at the urban level or the municipal level. At the national level, you know, you can, you know, you can attack, you know, credit. You can do a lot of things, right? Because ultimately, the prices of our houses they're not so much driven by the availability of houses anymore. They're driven by the availability of cheap money and cheap credit. That's what's driving uh, the rise of the financial industry, which is not something that cities can actually influence. What cities can influence, of course, the provision of socialized housing and social housing, which is how much of housing was made affordable in Western Europe after the Second World War. Now, most of the cities, including the cities in the, Nether in the Netherlands and in Germany and in the rest of what we consider Western Europe, have made those housing stocks uh, private yeah. to raise money for the cities that have lost their housing bases. So if you manage to, you know, again, I can't blame cities for nation states who have lost the tax base, having reformed tax system, having lost manufacturing, having not found a way to tax financial enterprises, start taxing the financial industry here in the Netherlands, then you'll have more taxes. Once yeah. you have more taxes, you can actually build more houses that will be social. Um, 
Now, I, this is really not, sure? I don't, I don't want to put all the responsibility no. on him because this is exactly how this neoliberal system functions. You devolve more power to cities, but cities are powerless. You know, you go and listen to Benjamin Barber. He's dead now, but anyway, he keeps on telling you that mayors rule the world. But who rules mayors? Mayors are run by a bunch of consulting firms who give them the advice and the things to do. This is the reality of most cities today. So all this stuff about urbanism, kind of, you know, participatory, democratic, mayors in charge of it, it's nonsense. Cities are slaves to modern finance. Laurens? Yeah, I totally agree. But uh, uh, in, fa <laughs> in fact, we can do one thing more uh, in Amsterdam. We still own the ground. We still own the, the land. So we can do something here in Amsterdam. When we build something, we can say what we want that is going to be built. Uh, um, so I'm very glad. We had some, uh, some big uh, parts of Amsterdam that we are going to develop. And there were companies who said, I want to develop everything. Just give me that land, uh, 5,000 houses or something like that. They wanted to do everything. They wanted to build the schools. They wanted to build the infrastructure. They wanted to build every house. And we said as a city, no, that's not you who's going to do that. We are going to decide what is going to be built. And we own the infrastructure. We built those uh, infrastructure and those, those schools. So we can still do something sure, because sure. we own the land. And that's very important. I, uh, and we have I, I have a question uh, I, here. Um, Martijn, I just... For, yeah, sorry. Um, I came to this lecture because I was really interested about the role of technology and that actually the whole city is influenced by technology-based hmm. companies like Facebook, Airbnb. It's like um, So, but I don't understand. In Amsterdam, we're all merchants, so we can complain about Airbnb and about all the Uber, Deliveroo, God knows what. But in essential, we all want to make money. So how can we, technology has this flight. It's in our system, we can't live without it. But we're still complaining about all the negative influences. And I really liked your discussion, but nobody of you gave an answer. We complain about a lot of things, but nobody looks in his heart and think, oh, well, technology, too much influence. So what's so your question? How can question, we? My question, now, basically to Mr. Morozov, because mm -hmm. you've seen all the world and you've looked at technology and the influence about it. This is the thing. Technology is really important. So what's your question? Sorry. Getting to it. Mm -hmm. um, we're all human. We want to make money. So how can we uh, be in balance with making profit and still look at, is it still social? Yeah. Are we still looking out for each other? Good question. Yeah. Yevgeny. Sure. <laughs> Uh, well, it's a profound philosophical question, which I kind of try to almost dismiss at the beginning of my lecture by trying to make the flow of the lecture go in a certain direction rather than the philosophical one. But uh, I don't buy the premise that uh, you know being a merchant in Amsterdam at this point is a sustainable proposition, because ultimately you become a merchant of yourself. Uh, and you start selling more and more of yourself. Well, you've had those kind of merchandise here as well. You know, I don't want to dismiss uh, the history that you've had with selling yourself in Amsterdam. But uh, nonetheless, uh, I don't think that under the conditions of how capitalism and not technology operates today, this is a sustainable proposition. My entire lecture was kind of countering this idea that what we are discussing here are some trends inherent to technology. I can assure you that there is a very different way to deploy sensors, big data, algorithms, and platforms to have a society that does not leave on extraction of value from the most impoverished uh, members of society, that actually creates value for everybody, that does not have to pursue this policy of data extractivism. You can do a lot of things with technology. I'm not against it. I don't buy the premise that we're all somehow mercantile and now there to make a quick buck. I mean, this is not how society traditionally worked. This is how we have been made to work to restore that lost profitability that uh, capitalism lost in the 1970s. In that sense, the years and decades that we call neoliberalism, now the 1970s onwards, it worked. 
for capital. It did help to restore profitability at a huge cost, some of which we're only now beginning to actually recognize. Yeah. Some of those costs were environmental, some of those were financial, some of those had to do with the rise of the right-wing fascism that we're now beginning to digest. There were a lot of costs. There were a lot of externalities involved in making capital work again. Right? And I think, I think that the challenge in front of us is to think about how you can use technology sensors, 3D printers, Internet of Things, and so forth, in a way that does not amplify, accelerate, and aggravate all of the trends I have outlined, but actually reverse them yeah. and make it easier for us to have a sustainable way of life. Yeah. I think we have 10 more minutes, then we go to the bar, so I think it's really nice also for Mr. Morozov. Um... You think I need a drink? <laughs> yeah, also, yeah, yeah, yeah. But I'm also well, something you um, um, <laughs> to stay actually for 10 minutes. I think that's doable. I'm going to ask... You to give your question. Great, thanks. Uh, I'm a co-founder of a foundation based here in Amsterdam called the Foundation for Public Code, and we do a lot of open source development with municipalities, networks of municipalities in Europe. We're actually working with the city of Amsterdam, with the Office of Innovation of, of Information Statistics, also with Barcelona. Point being that uh, that uh, you've talked a lot about data. I think uh, software actually is the issue really at hand here because it's really the thing that we're getting to is uh, is the the intersection of the state, the sort of code of the state and the code of the actual software that's being mm -hmm. deployed intersecting and that's what, what is not happening yet in the public sector is the fact that all of these multinational companies have large operational dynamic system models before we even get to this idea of artificial intelligence uh, you know these companies are operating with enormous yeah. bodies of active code that are making decisions on their behalf so what's your and question? The, the, the state right now doesn't have those capabilities uh, it's really interesting to me I think that what we are seeing and what Evgeny is talking about and you know some of the w work that we're doing is that the city turns out to be the sort of level of quantization of the public infrastructure yeah. that seems to be able to make start making these moves and I'm sort of wondering what you why you think that is the case uh, rather than federal governments or um, you know state governments uh, why is it the city that can operationalize in this way and what is it you know w what is yeah, it about yeah. that, that that's <laughs> going to be so we think we're going to speed up the questions a little bit, but Evgeny... Do you want to take a couple and respond yes, to all of them? Yes, I'm, I'm going to see, I saw someone there, so then I'll go to you. Do you write them down? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I promise to come to you, yeah. Oh, sorry. Thanks. Uh, so, I, uh, Evgeny, I have... I've seen you before, we have many yeah. things to disagree about. I totally disagree with your narrative, but I think you're on, with, on a trend. And I wanna ask a question actually of the alderman, because I've written at least one op-ed about Airbnb's impact on Amsterdam. It's fairly well known that the city, as you just said, doesn't necessarily have any data, and yet Airbnb can make this data available at the snap of a finger because the city does control the land, they do control the regulations, they do control the housing market. They do much more than Airbnb, is my rep response to your nodding head. Or your uh, wagging head. So my question is, when is a city going to get on top of Airbnb? And I say this in the context of words that has been said tonight, which I think is needs to be part of this conversation, which is the city as a, a commons, as well as an area of private, uh, not values, but private property. And the city needs to manage the balance between those things. And mm -hmm. I think that's a good framework. And I don't know why the city is not defending the commons against Airbnb's incursions as into the neighbors who yeah. are there. Yeah. That's my question. I think that's a good question. I'm going to add one more and then we have lots to process, I guess. Um, so, no, I first go to him and then... I'm feeling very privileged to be a citizen of Amsterdam. And Amsterdam is a bike city too. And True. The, uh, the local government is taking a lot of nice uh, measurements for them making new lanes, new paths, new storage, but there is still becoming a very, very big problem. And so I think a lot of technology can have some solutions, but it is taken in a very broad mindset of privacy and so on, uh, that the public uh, will accept that solution. Have you written that down? So actually, it's a question to you. <laughs> could you could you please? I, I didn't really get the question. Could you please get the question? One no, I, I think uh, there is a lot of te te technology yes. for solutions, but you had 
uh, in the politics, we have the, 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 the crown, the, the, mm -hmm. the mind of the change. Mm -hmm. And I think in Amsterdam we are giving a lot of money to have uh, 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 the facilities for the banking people, but there are a very big problem, and the politics don't take now management to solve that problem. Ah, so you see how technology can solve yeah. the biking problem yeah. with all the bikes. Okay, okay. So um, I, w I would suggest we dive into answers to these questions, and then I do a question round once more. So um, we're closing into a quarter to ten. So think about if your question if you really want to hear it, and then I'll come to you. But first, um, let's start with Yevgeny, the question. Sure, no, I'll, I'll be very brief. I mean, I, that's at the heart of my argument, which you know, I didn't fully develop, that the city as a unit has become key to the imaginaries and kind of political programs of virtually all the competing ideologies that we have now. I can make you a very coherent case, if you had enough time, that it's key to the neoliberal ideology and thinking it's key to the right-wing fascist one and it's key to the kind of hard left one, which, you know, increasingly centers around some kind of municipalist vision. Uh, there are different reasons for why it's the case for those three different ideologies. I think the dominant one, which unfortunately is the neoliberal one, and to some extent, the responses to it drive the municipalist vision from the left has to do with what I've been discussing at the very beginning. The growth in both financialization and the services industry has more or less blown the real estate uh, industry out of proportion. I mean, they really are becoming, if you look at them as the so-called fire industry, finance, insurance, and real estate, they really have become and are becoming one of the dominant shares of the economy. And clearly, cities play a hugely important role uh, for that part of the economy, the manufacturing shrinks everywhere. Like, you know, it's not just that it shrinks in the US or in Germany, or in the Netherlands, it shrinks across the globe, right? With fire sector rising up. And for reasons that are a bit difficult to explain in such a short time, cities are key to that industry, which mm -hmm. then creates all sorts of counter pushes, including from municipalist movements, housing movements, housing activists, and so forth, who do not really like many of the consequences of that rise, which again positions the city not just as a key battleground, but also as a way to experiment with new modes of providing infrastructure, electricity, gas, water, funeral services, you know, and you name it. There are new ways to do it, and municipalism seems to be the dominant imaginary also what remains of the left. Elderman Evans, um, the question of the gentleman there, are we on top of Airbnb? Can we combine the commons and the privates in a city like Amsterdam? And maybe you can also address the bike problem. And the first, first of all, the bike problem, we, we all, as people in Amsterdam, we, we recognize the bike, bike problem, but I think the solutions aren't not very, very simple. Um, uh, sometimes we hear about a maximum speed on the bikes. I don't think uh, that will fit Amsterdam. Uh, those are, in fact, those are solutions when you, uh, have to, uh, have m when you want to have more bikes. So it's a solution to a problem, but I don't uh, think it fits in Amsterdam. Uh, and I think for the bikes, we have to cheer that so, uh, a lot of people in Amsterdam go on a bike. We ha just have to give them more space. Okay. That's the most, yeah. uh, most easy thing to do. Um, the question about Airbnb, I think it's, it's a difficult question because, first of all, there is Airbnb. We are not in, uh, in Korea, uh, in, in the northern Korea, where we can uh, say there is no Airbnb allowed here. There is uh, internet, so there is Airbnb. Uh, second of all, there is here the, uh, the legislation, the laws are made in The Hague. And it's allowed. If you have a home, your own home, it's allowed, as long as you live in your home, to invite some tourists when you're gone. So that's allowed. So what we are doing in Amsterdam is dealing with the problems that there is a website and there is legislation that it is allowed here in Amsterdam. And I think that that, that is a problem that it is allowed because in some neighborhoods I would say, okay, it's less allowed or even not allowed in some neighborhoods because there are too much tourists in some neighborhoods, mm -hmm. but it's allowed by the national law. So we are saying to the national law, okay, this is too much, there is too much allowed. But you can just only go to The Hague and say, okay, this is a problem, but you can also do something about it. So what we did is a lot of enforcement, a lot of new methods for, of enforcement. We had those compulsory um, registration uh, yeah. now. And of course, we have uh, made a business agreement with Airbnb, a business agreement where they 
uh, give the right information to the people, but which doesn't make us dependent on Airbnb. I think that's very important. If you are dependent on Airbnb for our, uh, for our enforcement, then we are going the wrong direction. We have to do our enforcement ourselves, and I think we have to have strong enforcement to keep our neighborhoods yeah. safe. Um, we are running into overtime, so I'd like to suggest that there are two more questions. Whoa, there are many people. Okay. Um, l let's make it two and one. Um, yeah, let, let's just make it two and go to the bar because we have a third half. Um, I'd go to this, madam, and I saw someone there, yeah, who was quite long. Um, and um, after that, I'd like to ask you one more question uh, for all the four of you, and I'd like really short answers. Like, if we continue this discussion on cities and technology, I think usually debates are also about asking the right, the right questions. So what is going to be the question we need to address in debates that are coming in the next month. So maybe you can think about that already. So I first come to you, Miss. Okay, thank you. Um, well, I think uh, we need another narrative uh, against uh, digitalization, globalization, um, and servicization. So for instance, um, localization, democratization, sovereignty, and things like that. Saying that, I have a question. Uh, what about uh, changing the monetary system. So not let uh, private banks create money, but um, a public uh, institute, uh, for instant, instance, with uh, interest-free, mm -hmm. interest but public banking, it's uh, developing in the, in, yep. the, in the USA, and um, we can do it. Yeah, it's a big balloon to get up at the last five <laughs> minutes, but maybe Yevgeny can still do it. And I'll run to you for the last question. Thank you. I'm Jelle de Graaf, the live tracker for the Piratenpartij here in Amsterdam in the municipal elections. Um, I have a question. I think uh, René Frisse brought up a good point about being reactive to um, all the um, developments that are going on this way or being proactive uh, mm -hmm. and, um, about uh, data sovereignty. And she asked the question twice, but twice she didn't get an answer. So maybe we shouldn't ask it to the Wethouder Lauren Evans, but to um, Evgeny. Do you maybe have examples of cities that um, well, that could guide us the way, show us how to um, improve data sovereignty of our people, of our city. Yep. I'm thinking, for example, Barcelona but has a project on this. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so, so we need a tip on examples. Um, so we have two questions. Evgeny. Yes, um, so very quick. So uh, fixing the monetary system, yes and yes. Uh, again, uh, there is little I can say more than that. There are ways in which you can set up community banks, have a very different you know, system of financing innovation that is not so much dependent on, uh, you know, banks no longer lend money to companies, if you haven't noticed. They just lend money to people who take mortgages. That's primarily the role that banks now serve. I mean, most of the bank, most of the lending has nothing to do with productive investment of any capacity, right? So this is something that you have to understand. But having said that, you have to understand that capitalism has not fixed this profitability problem. Right? It has addressed it temporarily through all of those mechanisms I mentioned, financialization, globalization, and servitization, and so forth. But the ultimate trend has not been fixed. And you have to understand that it has arrived at that problem even when things were working well. We still had Bretton Woods, where you still had more or less locally contained capital. We didn't have financialization. Where you had the best possible setup for capitalists to function, it was already running in the kind of uh, a dead wall. Right? So, of course, you can create a different narrative about localization, can create a different narrative about let's get rid of financialization, let's get rid of all mm -hmm. of that. But the underlying economy, to me, seems kind of screwed, right? So yes, we can have a different narrative, but there needs to be something also at the level of structural transformation of the economy that will involve, to some extent, public banking, but needs to involve much more. Uh, on the question of cities, uh, again, I mean, I think you've pointed in the right direction and that, you know, Barcelona seems to be quite advanced in trying to politicize a lot of these issues in a good way and trying to show that there is a political economy behind data and there is a political economy behind much of the transformation that has been pushed in many cities through the Internet of Things and the smart city. Uh, I think there are a lot of, uh, there, are, there is at least one joint project that Amsterdam has with Barcelona uh, called Decode, which looks at data ownership actually and different ways to implement it. I think it's actually quite a worthy project. 
Um, there are a lot of other things that are happening in other cities that have to do with efforts to remunicipalize certain parts of the uh, kind of service economy, right? Whether it has to do with basic infrastructure, basic utilities. The question that needs to be solved there is how do you municipalize something that's not even physically located uh, and controlled in your city? And this is where I think a lot of cities have a hard time understanding what it is they can do about data, what is it they can do about cloud computing and so forth. So not many of them can be presented as positive examples, you know, outside of Barcelona and a few others. But even cities like Moscow, you know, I wouldn't discount them, for example. They have done some interesting work, for example, on data localization. They managed to force Uber to share all the local data about taxi rights with the local competition authority and I think the local transportation authority, right? They managed to do it mostly by threatening to just kick Uber yeah. out of the market. But it's, a, it's an interesting intervention. I wouldn't necessarily, you know, like, yes, there is Airbnb, you can't kick it out, but you can threaten to kick it out. I mean, I see no problem and you've done it, right? So again, I don't think you have to go beyond the idea that these firms are promoters of freedom of expression just because they're on websites. Because otherwise, you will end up in decline. That's one lesson that China has learned. I'm sorry to be promoting China here, but China is the only country that has an alternative plan. Why? Because they have the Great Firewall, which was not only an instrument of censorship, which is bad, 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 but it was also an excellent tool of trade. They just said, American companies, we keep them out, we keep, we keep growing our own domestic industry. That's why the only alternatives to American digital firms are Chinese ones. Yeah. It's very robust, it's giant economy. Europe has zero. So we can continue promoting and celebrating the fact that we are not North Korea or China, but given where the economy is going, you will end up probably even worse than North Korea uh, if you do not develop your own robust digital economy, which you can't do without some strong measures as Chinese show us. Yeah. So, closing remarks. Yeah, um, well, I, I just wanted to add one more example to that. Yeah. Um, uh, an interesting one from Sao Paulo, and actually that answered the closing question as well. So, how can you put public values central in the organization of, of platforms, right? Rather than sort of have them optimize on some sort of Silicon Valley logic, can you sort of interfere in them from a public values perspective? Perspective. And I think in Sao Paulo, there's sort of an interesting uh, proposal for legislation where all the, the transport network companies, or companies like Uber, they have to uh, start buying credits from the, the central government. So basically, it's a, it's a kilometer tax uh, for every kilometer that they carry passengers through the city. They have to pay a certain amount. But they have started to also um, dynamically price this tax. So if, for example, uh, the, public, uh, the, the taxi takes you to a part of the area where there is not so much public transportation, the tax is a little lower. They've also said that 15% of all the credits that are being bought by these companies, they have to be bought by uh, female taxi drivers, right? So they're using the platforms um, to pursue some public values that they've set in, yeah. in their council, which is emancipation of women in the workforce, and trying to put that sort of in the logic of platforms. I think that could be an interesting direction. Yeah. Evgeny, well. do you have a last question we should address? Ah, sorry, I forgot about the last question. Uh, <laughs> I think I'm okay, to be honest. Did I, did I not pose enough questions? Yeah, I think you posed enough questions, yeah. <laughs> and then that there are some left for Elderman Evans to answer, but maybe you have a last question also. Yeah, I think one of the main concerns that we have is how can we stay democratic in this changing society? Because you see there are a lot of um, companies and even people now who just see Amsterdam as a machine to make a lot of money. Uh, and how can we stay democratic? And that's... I'm not saying how can we say socialistic because when you are here you are become more socialist than. Uh, than Aren't you from before. the socialist party? And I Sorry. already was socialist, so ah. it is very good. <laughs> this, uh, this, 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 yeah. But I say, how can okay. we stay democratic? Because yeah. that's I think uh, one of my concerns. Yeah, Rene. Well, it's nice because I think uh, I have a small answer formulated into a question. Um, I would be very curious to know about, uh, let's say we, we take this optimistic view and uh, it, you'll be able to be somehow independent in terms of data. You, you'll be more proactive. I think we should really talk about the data deserts. And that's a, a concept that my colleague of the IPW uh, talks about a lot. The stuff we don't know to shape the democratics in terms of data. So how do we know what we want to know to keep families out of debt? How do we know how to build better youth care systems? Because the way we now design these policies are very four-year plan, not, not reacting to what people actually need. There are a lot of stuff is happening where we collect data, but we don't use it to serve it for the better. Um, and I think it would be really, really important to ask ourselves what can we do to, 
to make sure that our welfare state is actually serving the people we need. Because we're talking about Airbnb and the houses are being rented, but we haven't really talked about other people in the city. So I would really want to ask, what about this, the other citizens? What about the, 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 the people who are not served in general at all by this discussion about data? And I think especially you as a, as a government should focus on this group because the other group is being served by itself eh? in terms of the have-nots and, have, and, and the haves and the cans and the cannots. How are you as a citizen... Um, also making this discussion more inclusive. Make it more inclusive, but also be very clear on uh, who are you protecting? Who are you serving? Who, are you, who is needed most in this digitalization? Who will be left out yeah. if you don't step up? Do you want to give a really small last Yeah, answer? I can give a lot of answers, but then I'm, I'm sitting here as the leader of a socialistic party, because then yeah. I have some clear answers. But uh, I, I totally agree. This city government doesn't have all the answers to those questions at this moment, because we have a city government with some left-wing and some right-wing parties in it. So then it's, it's not easy to give that, uh, that, uh, that answer. So in a but sense, you're saying we should I, 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 explore I'm this look, discussion I'm more. I'm looking forward a lot to the elections yeah. in March uh, 2018. I I think we have to uh, give a right direction which we are going, yeah. uh, uh, in which direction we, are, uh, we have to go. Yeah. And that's why I, always, uh, I also ask the question, how can we stay democratic? Yeah. And I think you hear my answer then, yeah. uh, just let the people decide. And the people are, of course, the people who yeah. have the, the smallest voices here. Is that why you got rid of the referenda here? Yeah, we can they talk about trying. the referendum yeah. later. Yeah. Um, <laughs> But I first want to give a big round of applause for our panel, so give them a round of applause. Um, I want to thank you for your patience because we've uh, run into overtime 10 minutes. Um, I'm sure everyone remains here for the questions I didn't get to, to gather and to get answers, so please stay for the drinks afterwards and uh, have a nice trip home and I hope to see you again in the Bali. Thank you so much. Thank you.